Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to kind of build um, the uh, the code that does parsing. Now, the 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 great these parsers that are constructed in this functional style <clears throat> um, are technically called recursive descent parsers. It, there is a huge literature, mostly from the early days of computer science on parsing, with some recent actual interesting uh, things going on in the area. But, but um, basically, you know, these, these were serious problems when you first started trying to write things like compilers. So I'm just going to, I'm going to, um, okay, this is going to be called Clark parser class. That's the module that I'm going to create. And I'm going to put the code in here. And it's surprisingly short what it takes to build the primitives to be able to actually parse and write a parser like the one that I did uh, the other day uh, that I gave you in the last homework for B expression. So let's start at like uh, some motivation a, a nice motivation i mean what you know if we look at um i'm gonna go back over here and i'm look at that b expression code and here's the data type so suppose we wanted to build a parser for for B expressions, I mean, what we really want is we want we 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 would want a new type of parsers, and we'd say, look, what's it going to do? It's going to take a string, um, and it's going to return a B expression. Now, the problem is, is that with this, is that we we this isn't really going to work because a parser doesn't. It's only if it succeeds in, in full that it, that it uses up all the string. The way it works is it eats up a piece of the string and then another piece of the string and another piece of the string to build together these more complex terms. So we don't do it all at once. So, you know, we can say, okay, look, uh, how can we model that here in the, in the type? We can say, okay, it's going to return some kind of B expression and the rest of the string that hasn't been parsed yet. So that's a good idea. But then you run into the issue that um, sometimes parsers fail. So you may not be able to return this. Now we could do, um, um, we could, could do this. And in fact, maybe we should just try this because um, I'm not, I mean, a maybe, you know, you could do a maybe of those pairs and, and, and have it be nothing if the parse fails, fails and have it be, um, you know, a pair, just whatever the, the, the expression together with the string. What, um, Graham Hutton, who we're working, whose code this is based on did was, uh, he said, let's make it a list of pairs of B expressions with strings. So it's a list of pairs like that. Oops, that's a string, not a sting. Well, but so now what's going to mean is if the function returns the empty list, that means the parts are failed. And if the function... Uh, returns a list, we only expect it to have one pair in it, which is the, a B expression and the rest of the string that still remains to be parsed. Now, <clears throat> it turns out that um, that worked okay, but look, here's, here's an, an, an issue with this declaration here is that well, what if, you know, we may be wanting to parse other things 
we may be wanting to parse numbers or we may be wanting to parse string, you know, strings or characters. So we're going to generalize this extremely. Now, this is a huge trip. We're going to abstract out the type of the thing that we're parsing by making it a parameter to the type itself. That's a huge step right there. And it makes essentially the ability to do that in the type system is, is what makes this such a great abstraction. Uh, now, the problem is, is that remember type just declares this thing to be a synonym for this thing. And you can't parameterize types. So we're going to use new type uh, constructor. And we're going to say parser A. And the one in, in you know, inconvenience with that is that I got to have a constructor that I wrap around the thing that I really want, is, which is... Um, String arrow, let me just um, a comma string. So there's my type. Now, the, the inconvenience is, is that I got to, when I want to get to the function, which is the actual parser, I got to like deconstruct it. I got to pull it out from under the make P. And uh, if I want to take a function and make it into a parser, I got to wrap the make P around it. So how do I use these things? One thing is, is we'll say, let's make a function called parse. And it's going to take a parser and it's going to take a string and it's just going to be pluck the function out from under the make p and apply to the string. So the one way I can do it here is I can say, oh, it's a make p of some function f. And all I do is I apply f to s. And so that's how parse is going to work. So this applies a parser to a string to return a thing. Now, um, Let's see what happens here. Um, let me quit out of this one and start up a new um, interpreter. Okay, so I'm going to load this parser class. Oh, I didn't save it yet. And okay, and so now. Well, what would a parser like we could, you know, okay, so that loads. Let, let's write the simplest parser we can. Let's write this one, and it, it's called item, and it's going to be a parser um, of characters. An item is like one of, is, is, is the, you know, um, like an atomic parser. It's like there's practically nothing simpler. So what item is going to do is it's going to be a parser. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, okay, to make P of, I don't need a paren there. It's going to be a make P and it's going to, now I got to describe a function that takes a string. I'll call it S. And what is this thing going to do? I want it to take a string and just pull off one character. So it's going to say um, match, or I'm sorry, case S of. And if S is the empty string, remember then it's the same. I mean, I could write it like, like this. If it's the empty string, then it's going to fail. And so here's like where there's a little, you know, overlapping system there between when, when is the empty list a string and when is the empty list mean failure for the parser. But here we're looking at a string S. If it's empty, we're going to, and it, otherwise it's a cons of some character onto some other characters. 
And all I'm going to return is I need to return a list containing the C and with the remaining things to be parsed are the C's. And so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to load parser class. And now I could say parse with the item from the string x, y, z, z, y. And I get, and that's what I get back. I've pulled, I've successfully pulled off one element off the front of the parser. Now there's some other um, kind of atomic parsers, which is um, one is what if I and and you know for reasons we will see below. Um, is return is one where it's going to be it's going to take something of type a and return a parser of of things of type a and return of x is going to be the make parser of and i write them always kind of the same s and all it's going to do is it's going to make x and it's not going to eat anything off the string, and it's just going to make x the result. All right. So now I could say like return, and you know, um, one. Now I need to parse. Well, you know, what's what's that going to be? That's going to be. Um, uh, type of that. Oh, it's all right. I'm overloading return. So let's just apply the parse. Apply parse return one to the string x, y, z, z, y. Okay. What if I just call this um, inject? We're going to want it to be called. Uh, the reason I'm having troubles with that is we're going to want it to be called um, return for it to work properly, the monad class, but we'll just make inject now. And so that just plugs that in. It doesn't eat anything off the string. Um, like item pulled the first element off, inject, just makes a parser that returns whatever you give it. And so, you know, I could use complicated things. I could use just, you know, a list containing one here, and I'm going to get back a parser that looks like that. So that's that's going to turn out to be a useful thing uh, when we when we get a little bit further on. So now here's a little more complicated one. Here's an interesting one. Sat is going to take a character, a, a predicate on characters, a function that we given a character says true or false, and um, then it returns a um, parser of characters and what sat p is going to be is it's going to be the make key the make parser it's going to take an s an input string and um it's going to do a case s of if the string is empty well then it's going to fail but if the string has something like c with some c's then what it's going to do is it's going to say if p if the predicate holds for the for the character c then we're going to return the list containing c 
with the remaining string to be parsed, else we're going to return the empty is also failing, failure. Let's load it, it reload this, and so if I say parse, um, now I need a, um, a predicate. So let me let me just I think um, let me just write one write one up here uh, lower C is that whoops C is an element of the list A dot dot Z. Okay, so there's lower and you can see we can do uppers and other ones. Well, let's do upper. Of course, I want this to be capital A now and capital Z and, you know, I don't know, um, digit is that it's in the character zero dot dot nine. Okay, so now we have some character predicates to work with, and so we can say, um, all right, let's reload it. And so I can say, like, uh, parse. Sat. Lower. X, Y, Z, Z, Y. Whoops. And I get the X because it's lower. If I say sat upper, it fails. If I say sat upper X, then it would work. Now, you know, remember spaces are in these things. So like, even though, you know, this, that won't work because the first character is not a lowercase character. So, all right, so these are some interesting parsers where we can start to to do things. But, I mean, I guess maybe I should write, you know, one more up here is I'll write the failure parser, which is going to be just a parser of every type. And this is just... Uh, you know, you may be starting to get used to this idea that, you know, that there's a lot of kind of like, um, um, algebraic and mathematical structures that turn out to be helpful when we're writing code, uh, in this functional style. So, all right, let's see. So that's what the failure parser does. It just takes a string and just always fails. It always returns to the empty list. Um, okay. Now we have some basic parsers. Now, our problem is, is we don't have any real means of, of kind of like gluing them together in a good way. So one, one way is like, what if I want to do one parser and if it f succeeds, return that value and otherwise um, try second parser. And it turns out that there's a, uh, a nice, and it turns out five is a good level of precedence to make this thing. It's pretty high. Uh, it's plus, plus, plus. And then what is the type of this plus, plus, plus? It's a kind of, it's some, sometimes called choice. It takes a parser of things of type A, and it takes another parser of things of type A, and it takes 
and it returned a parser of things of type A. And so what's going to happen here is P plus 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 Q going to be, it's a make P and it's a function that takes a string and it says, okay, case. Now parse using parse s using p and if you get a failure then we're just going to say okay parse using q otherwise if we got back some answer just return the answer Okay, so now what if we did like, you know, we had like, um, well, one thing we could do is we could say like, you know, okay, let's see, parse with failure and just fails. But if I say parse failure, let's say um, plus, plus, plus item, I get back the it works. It didn't fail because when the first one failed, it went and it tried the second one. So this is where we're trying the second one if the first one fails. And otherwise, we just return whatever it would have. So like if I did this, um, parse item and then failure, then I get the same thing because the item is succeed and never even got to execute that one. So that's a useful one. But it turns out that, well, um, uh, I mean, it turns out that, that the most useful one is a way of gluing things together called bind. And bind is going to do this weird thing. But, you know, I don't want to, it, it turns out that Bind is one of the functions that you must define for a data type to be an element of the monad type class. But to get a type into the monad type class first, it has to be an element of, it has to be a functor. And then it has to be applicative. And then we can get to uh, it being in the monad type class. So I've, I've imported control dot applicative here. Um, and I think, um, it's going to turn out that I want to probably port. I don't think I need it, but maybe, um, monad. Whoops, that doesn't look good. Okay. So first let's make uh, uh, parsers an instance of the functor type class. Now, you know, this is a like First, you, you remember, all we need to do is define an fmap function. It takes a function from A to B, and re then it takes, in this case, a parser from a, of things of type A and returns a parser of things of type B. And so how can we do it? Well, I say um, fmap. And so we need our function. That's the first argument that we're going to be putting in. And then we need a parser. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a new parser of things of type B. And so what we're going to say is case of parse uh, using P, parse S using P. And if it's failure, then we just 
fail. And if it's not a failure, then we've got something like an X, um, you know, more, more stuff to parse, more of the string, the remaining string. And so what are we going to do here? We're going to say, okay, return this where I apply F to X. So let's see. Oh, right. I put an equal sign. In. Okay. So, you know, um, how can we how can we use this? Well, we could say like you know um, a map, so I can parse, and I'm gonna f map. Uh, so this is gonna be a hiding function, and it'll be item let's say and let's and what's that going to do well it grabbed the x you know if i just parse with item i had an x in there and then it added this function that here i mean you know maybe this is a nicer thing to do is to say like you know like uh x um Um, what do I want to do? I want to say, like, take X, make it into a string, and add some message. So, FMAP allows us to... Now, what is the type of, um, first of all, the type of item, remember, was a parser of characters, but now what's the type of this thing here, fmap? Oh, I didn't want to do X up there. I mean, I should have done like... Um, And this is a parser of strings of list of characters. Let's retry the example with, with that more interest, the more sort of what I intended was like something like this. I want like the C to become a string. And so, now we have a sensible notion of this being a functor. All right. Now, what about applicative? Well, okay. You may forget. Uh, I mean, we could go over here and we can say colon uh, info applicative to remind ourselves about what, what it has. But Basically, we got to define a function called pure, which takes an A and returns a parser of things of type A. And we kind of already had that, right, with uh, inject is like pure. And that's why we were getting problems there. So if I want to make parsers applicative, 
um, I've got to define cure. And, you know, in a way, we could just say cure equals inject. Okay, and then we also have to find this thing that takes a parser of functions. So a parser of type A arrow B, and then a parser of type A and returns a parser of type B. So this is um, the star thing. Star. And what does it have? It has, it takes a, for this instance, for parsers as applicatives. Okay, so what's, it turns out that um, the sensible thing to do there is to do actually use plus, plus, plus which we already defined. This is kind of a sensible notion of this multiplication, I think. Is that right? Um, no. Okay, so what do we do? Sorry. If you, if you think of it this way, you think of like, okay, um, I, can, I can call this like, I'm going to call the first one PF because it's a parser of fung uh, that returns something of type A arrow B. And I give it a star and then I give it another parser, which we could just call Q. I don't need to call PF. I'll just call it P and Q. And Okay, and then what am I going to do? I'm going to do the same thing I always do, which is do a case of parse using P, S. And then what am I going to do? If it's a failure, it's going to be a failure. And if it's not a failure, then it looks something like this. And what is this uh, first thing in there is going to be a function because this parser returns functions. And then I'm going to have the rest of the string that still needs to be evaluated. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to parse with the F map of F to P. And I'm going to continue with the more the rest of the thing. Probably I should be calling this like S prime would be more readable. S prime is the remainder of the string. More I'm trying to be, uh, you know, descriptive of what it is. All right, let's see if this works. Line 74. 74. Oh, I know what happened here. So I forgot my closing parentheses for the opening one up here. I thought that's what I did. <laughs> On line 66, it's having some problems. parse f map that's the function from a to b oh i want to do it to q ah. typo okay so 
So what does this one do? Well, okay. I mean, I'm I off the top of my head, I'm like having trouble of thinking about All right. I mean, we can do it. We can say, okay, here, let's, let's make up a, uh, you know, like a, an example of a parser that, um, let's say, um, call it fump, 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 it's fun P. And what does it do? It um, is going to be a make P. So what I need is a parser that um, returns a function. And so what I want to do is I want to do something like uh, uh, returns a parser fun. Well, I mean, what's the easiest way to do it? I could just say it's a silly. I mean, I can use pure. I can say pure. Um, and the C arrow, um, type of that. Here's an easy way to get a function like that. So now I could say like, okay, um, pure, okay, let me, I've, I've already typed it in. Okay, I've got that. And now I do that with item. Now I got to do a parse. And, you know, And it grabbed and doubled up the first thing that it got. So it ran, it parsed with P. So what happens when you parse with P? I mean, it just generated a, um, it injected. So like, we, you know, we can look at like, um, if we go back and look at inject up here, it just makes a parser where you put whatever that thing is in the as the return element, and so that's what pure does. Is pure is just inject, so it created like you know I can you know the problem is you can't show functions, so it's a little harder to like display what's going on. But you know, like you did see that, like I could say inject, you know. Um, a arrow B into um, so I can parse this, or you know, I could say, you know, a hundred and ten. And it puts it in. And so if I put this function, which basically turns a character into a string, and then I want to apply, it doubles it up, and then I apply that to item, which just pulls off a character, it combines it in that way. I don't know yet how to make that, you know, like extremely useful, but I. We need to make parsers applicative before we can make them monads. And the monad uh, stuff you get from monad is just great, especially for parsing. So it turns out that, oh, let me go down here and say colon info monad. Okay, so here's what a monad is, is that it has these more interesting and more complicated ways of composing together parsers. So replace in your brain, replay when you read this, replace the M's by parser. And so this is the bind operator for monads. And we need to define that. And um, 
I guess that's it. That's the only thing we need to define. And so I'll just put a comment up here because it seems like if I put the type, try to write the type down in here, they don't like it. But what does it do? It takes a parser of things of type A and then a function that takes A's to a parser of things of type B and returns a parser of things of type B. So this is what we need to write, a function having that type, and we want it to behave in kind of the following way, is like it's going to run this parser, and so let me, um, we'll say like uh, P bind F is equal to, this is going to turn out to be, we got to make it be a parser of type B. But what's going to happen here is the second argument is a function that will apply to the output of the first, uh, to the output of the first argument to create a new parser. So, and apply that one subsequently. So let's see, let's see. To make the of um, a lambda s, and the first thing we do is um, parse um, using p, we parse the input string. And then what do we do? We say, okay, look, if that's a failure, then it just fails. But if it's not a failure, then we got back something like um, X, and we have more string to parse, yet to be parsed. So now what we do is we parse using F applied to X, more. Okay, let's try loading in and see. Okay, it seems like it's correct. So what's going to happen here is so, like, suppose I say, like, um, take an item, and then suppose that we bind that to the function that takes a character and, you know, doubles the character up. Kind of a dumb function, but okay. Except that this can't just double the character up. And, um, yes. No. Well, let's do this. Let's say, okay, it's a lambda x arrow, or it's a lambda c arrow. And what is it going to do? Then it's going to do item again. We could bind that one to, uh, all right, well, let's just see item. And what's the type of this? Parser of characters. So let's try what happens if we try parse. Item. Okay, so what happened? It ran item that plucked off the X. Now the X is in the C here. Is the C holds the character X. And then it ran item again that plucked off the Y and it re returned that. So I could use, and I just said return, even though it's kind of like... Um, and then I could say return um, I'll call this C whoops C1 
Well, this one, lambda C2. Then I can say return. Let's let's flip them. C2 comma C1. Now, the thing is, is that by making this a monad, we got some really interesting extra features here. So we can say parse, and now I'm going to use do notation, which is what comes with monad. And I could say C1 gets the value of item. And then C2 gets the value of item. And then I can say return. C2 comma C1. I'm returning a pair in this one. I didn't. Oh, I did return a pair. I could say like, you know, return. That took off the first character and stored it in C1. It took off the second character and stored it in C2. And then it returned the string, which was composed, uh, constructed by flipping the two of them. All right. Now we have, now it turns out this do notation is really um, very powerful, but also potentially confusing. Um, now, lists are monads, so we have it for lists as well. It works for all kinds of monads. But let's look at some other parsers that we can write now. Like we can write, um, Oh gosh, what are some of the ones that I want to write that are that are more that are you know a bit more interesting here? I'm gonna have to look in. Uh, well, I guess I can just um, this is all in your parser base file. So. There's item, there's sat, there's digit. Now here's a lower parser of characters. I should probably make that that way in, in the thing that we're doing. Character, oh, this is a good one. We didn't write before. Character only succeeds if it's the char if the X is the next character. Now here's a use of the first use of do is we've got string. I'm going to go back and we'll just add it here for now. And so it says it takes a string and we turn to parser of strings. And I'm going to need that um, character parser. I need character, which is takes a character and returns a parser of characters. And that one is, now see, we, we, we're going to start escaping from writing down kind of these things and just being able to combine parsers that we already have. So I can say that this is the parser sat. Character x is equal to sat. And remember, equals equals x is a predicate. That's true if the input is equal to the character x. So, you know, in a way, this might read better like this in some way. Like, okay, if the string that you're passing is the empty string, that's what you're looking for. You return the empty string. So you succeed. You're looking for the empty string. You succeed. So you get a return. It's not, that's different from saying just this. 
right? Re that is failure. Return the empty string. Um, we can see um, how it works in here. We can say parse, return empty. And that gives you back, and that's the same thing as, you know, as this. The empty string is the same as that. So if you're looking for the empty string, you always succeed. You find it. And so that's why you do this return. Maybe I should do this like that. And then if the string has an X on the front, then what you do is on your input, you look for an X. And then, so now we're using this do thing. And so now it says first look for an X and then look for the tail of the string. And when you're done, return X's. So let's see what this does. Um, so if I say like um, parse string X, X on X, Y, Z, Z, Y, it fails first. But if I say, like, parse this on X and let's look for a little bit more Y, then it succeeds. Um, so that's... That's pretty interesting. So now, like, if you're looking for a keyword, like, if I'm looking for if... You know, in my, I can say parse string if, and then I say I'm looking for if, X, then, you know, then, blah, 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 who cares? It says, yeah, I found the if. So now you can look for keywords or particular things that you already know what you're looking for. So let's go look at some other ones in here. Um, okay, now these who are extremely powerful. So let's add those and, and look and see how they work. So what happened here first? Many, you give it a parser. And it, it's looking for zero or more. It's going to return a list of results of type A. And so it's going to like, if you're looking for like uh, many characters, you're going to get back a list of all those characters. So like, look, if I say parse any, um, and the parser is item. Yeah, well, ah, I apologize. There's a um, I need to go up here and I gotta hide. Um, any I think it's in there. Okay. Now, if I say many item, it's always going to get everything. Look, there's no leftover input because item just gets the next character. So this thing is just going to grab everything one at a time and build up this giant long string. What if I say, um, um, uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't really make those things. We need to go back and make lower and upper departures, really. I should say lower, upper digit. These are all going to be um, they're going to be parsers of characters. And to do that, I just say like, you know, um, Oh, 
Oh, what do I need to do here? I want to say sat. Okay, and it's looking at the next character. And so there, that works. That should work. And so then. So why does that work? Well, it worked because sat is a parser. And so I want these things to have a parser of characters. I want the uh, lower, upper, and digit to be parsers of characters. And it takes a predicate and you give the predicate and, and, and it applies that predicate to the first element of the list. And if it's true, then it succeeds in parsing and otherwise it fails. So like, let's go down here. We can say like, uh, parse lower I play ZZY it's oh I got to reload and it succeeds if I say parse you know digit It's the one off the front. If I say parse digit and I don't have a digit, it fails. So and so forth. Okay. So I want to say like now I could do something like parse many. Digits. So if I had like a string of numbers, I could get them, the digits off that way. And um, there that turned it into an actual number because this read function i told it try to read the string one two three four or whatever one two three two one two three four try to read that as an int and in that case it did it turned it into an int so you know what's what's the type of um read 12 Call an int. It actually is an int. It's the real int 12. It's not a string. So it turned it, it went the other way. What's going on in there? There's a little parser in there. We could write our own parser that would read strings of digits and turn them into things, but sorry, built in and read. Now, many one is. Uh, <clears throat> says, look, the parser has to succeed at least once. You got to get V. If the parser fails, the whole thing fails. So if the parser P succeeds, you've got a value. And now you can do zero or more. Many is like zero or more. And then you glue them together and put them together in a list. Now, many says, look, you can succeed with none. And in that one, you call many one. So either you get one or more choice operator with return the empty. So if I say like, you know, like many <clears throat> of, you know, upper um, one, two, three, ah, I got to parse. That was going to be a problem. So it got nothing there, but it succeeded. But if I said many one upper, 
it failed. It's a kind of a, 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 you know, an important distinction between the two of them. Okay, so I think that's probably more than enough for this lecture, and we'll come back and start to actually show you how to use these things to build interesting parsers like the one for V expression. Okay, thanks for listening. Let's see, how do I get out of here?